All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we've got a, looks like a great crowd, over 80 attendees. Uh, I'm gonna turn things over to our Dean, Lee Fisher, and allow him to um, welcome everyone. And Lee, you're, uh, you are on mute. That was a silent welcome on mute. Now I'll do it publicly. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Lee Fisher. I'm the Dean of Cleveland Marshall and welcome to this very special forum today. Uh, in a minute, uh, Associate Dean Jonathan Whitner Rich will be introducing our very special guest. I just wanna thank her uh, for taking the time to do this today because she's nationally known and respected. But more importantly, I cannot think of an issue that is more timely or more important in our country today. Uh, long before May 25th and the death of George Floyd, this was an important issue. I know because I served both as an attorney general and as a member of the Cleveland Police Commission. So I've been working on these issues for a long time. Uh, and of course, we know what's happening in Minneapolis as we speak. So it's timely to have one of the most, ex the most foremost expert in the country with us today. Thank you again for being here uh, and tuning in. And I turn it back to Associate Dean Jonathan Whitford Rich. Great. Thank you very much. So. Um... Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Monica Bell. She is Associate Professor of Law at Yale Law School and Associate Professor of Sociology at Yale University. Uh, her area of expertise include criminal justice, welfare law, housing, race in the law, uh, qualitative research methods, and law and sociology. Some of her recent work has been published in the Yale Law Journal, Law and Society Review, the NYU Law Review, the Duke Law Journal, among many others. Uh, she's published in popular outlets such as the Los Angeles Review of Books and the Washington Post. Uh, Professor Bell is a first-generation college student and uh, college graduate and then earned, earned her BA at Furman University where she was a Truman Scholar and went on to earn a Master of Science degree from the University of College Dublin where she was a Mitchell Scholar. Uh, her JD is from Yale Law School and then she uh, capped it off with a PhD in Sociology and Social Policy from Harvard University. Uh, before joining the Yale Law faculty, she was a Clemenco Fellow uh, at Harvard Law School, and she ser served as a Lehman Fellow at the Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia, where she worked on matters related to cash assistance to families and disabled adults, child support, unemployment insurance, homeless services, health care, and other legal and policy issues affecting low-income women and families. She also clerked for the Honorable Cameron McGowan Curry of the United States District Court for the District of South Carolina. The title of her presentation today is How Policing Reinforces Racial Segregation in the 21st Century. Um, and please um, uh, take it away, Professor Bell. First, thank you so much for having me be a part of this forum. It's truly an honor to be here. Uh, I am uh, humbled and excited to share this work with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I'm gonna present for about hopefully 40 minutes or so. Hopefully I won't take it too much longer, um, but uh, I look forward to sharing this work with you. So uh, as uh, was stated, the focus of my presentation is really on how policing reinforces racial residential segregation. And I think this issue is particularly salient in a lot of our urban uh, areas, metropolitan areas. Um, you know, I've done a research in Cleveland. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that work in the, in the Cleveland area uh, in this presentation. But just to kick it off, so there are gonna be three main portions of my talk. So first I'm gonna talk about the persistence of residential segregation. I think the starting point here is just to say, what am I talking about when I say policing reinforces residential segregation? Uh, like what is residential segregation by race in the 21st century as opposed to how we have thought about uh, racial residential segregation in the past. Second, I'm gonna talk about some of the mechanisms of what I call pro-segregation policing. And that's really status quo policing, but, but you'll understand that better as I reach that point in the presentation. And then finally, I wanna spend some time on anti-segregation approaches to policing and police reform. And I'll just go ahead and, and your preview of coming events. I'm not gonna tell you here how to totally undo the relationship between policing and residential segregation. And that may frankly not be possible in the status quo organization of policing. However, the focus is to just point out some, some proposals that might get us closer to having 
a uh, policing system that does not just merely reinforce pre-existing racial residential segregation. So now to the persistence of segregation. So what is racial uh, residential segregation? I spend uh, quite a lot of time in the paper that was shared as part of the CLE defining racial residential segregation. Uh, what's key is that you know, often, uh, so, so we have this kind of historical idea based largely in school segregation and Jim Crow laws that uh, racial uh, segregation is de jure. And then we had something like desegregation or something. Um, we had a change in the law. And so now we're talking largely about de facto segregation. So I think you should take it as a given that when I talk about residential segregation, I'm not talking about traditional old school de jure segregation. Now, one could, of course, argue that the law, many aspects of the law support de facto segregation. But, but here, so, so one big piece of when we talk about de facto segregation is mere separation. So uneven geographic distribution of various racial or ethnic groups across a geographic area. Um, so that's separation. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that uh, a, a few slides in, so I'm not gonna linger there too long. Second, I talk about movement of marginalized ethnic groups or racial groups into identifiable and stigmatized enclaves, so concentration. Now, it was mentioned earlier that I'm a sociologist. This idea of concentration of uh, ethnic groups into stigmatized enclaves is really key uh, from a sociological perspective. So, you know, the kind of lay language that you might hear arise around this aspect of residential segregation are words like the ghetto, right? So like, um, while that is a racialized and to some people offensive term, it is also a precise term for understanding the kind of interlocking uh, concentration of poverty, of disadvantage of various sorts in particular enclaves. Now in the project, in the longer paper um, that you might've had a chance to read, I spend some time distinguishing between uh, concentration of you new know, disadvantage and separation that might be in some time, in some cases empowering. So I compare and contrast, for example, the um, kind of uh, stigmatized uh, black neighborhoods and urban areas that some people call ghettos. I compare those with, for example, Native American reservations where the point of Native American reservations is sovereignty. The point is self-governance. And of course, one can imagine, and there have existed in the past, uh, black areas that have been designed by black people and, and, and selected by black people as spaces of empowerment and belonging. So I'm thinking here about you know, examples like um, Soul City in North Carolina. There's recently a new book by Thomas Healy about Soul City, um, which you know, we could talk, we could debate the particulars of that. And I'm happy to talk about that more in QA. But uh, Perhaps some better examples would be the all black towns in Oklahoma, um, which is a place that I've been doing some research uh, and you know, particular areas in, in Tulsa. So, uh, so that's not concentration, right? So that is separation for the purpose of empowerment, but concentration is about uh, moving people into stigmatized areas on the basis of race. So the third part of the racial residential segregation uh, definition that I talk about is that the purpose and design of segregation is in order to establish and reproduce hegemonic racial hierarchy, so subordination. The purpose, uh, and this is apropos of what I was saying earlier, uh, you could have separation that uh, is not subordinating, it, you know, i.e., for example, um, places of Black power or Native American sovereignty. Uh, but uh, to understand segregation, we have to have a clear view of its subordinating purposes and, uh, and kind of project. And then per, for me, perhaps I think maybe the most poorly uh, defined in the paper, but I think one of the most important, and I'll say a little bit more about this uh, shortly, is domination. So domination is the fourth part of a rich understanding of 
uh, racial residential segregation and the purpose and design of, of residential racial segregation is uh, to control and hoard social and political opportunity for advantage groups in ways that are collectively harmful, so domination. Here, what I'm trying to capture is the, uh, the ways that segregation actually benefits uh, economically in, in, in certain ways white people. Now, of course, it also has detrimental uh, affects for our collectivity. Uh, so, so that's what I, I mean by collectively harmful. Ultimately, segregation is, is bad for everyone. Uh, and um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about why that is. It, it helps us, it keeps us from seeing our common humanity. It, it uh, keeps us from seeing uh, our kind of common purpose in developing a robust social citizenship. But there are people who, uh, who benefit from segregation. And I think so often in studies and conversations about segregation, we think, oh, look at the poor subordinated uh, people of color without examining who's actually benefiting from a, a segregated landscape. And so a robust understanding and definition of racial residential segregation that I talk about here takes all four of these pieces into account. But I do wanna spend a little bit more time on separation. So I spend a lot of time in the paper uh, trashing uh, this uh, way, it's not really trashing the, the way of measuring segregation. So traditionally in sociology, but especially in economics, uh, there are, certain measures of segregation. And uh, so Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton developed the five part measure of segregation. I'm not talking about that classic uh, measure of se uh, segregation that they developed, which is quite robust. Um, instead, as a thin way of trying to capture segregation, uh, many economists especially rely on what is called the index of dissimilarity and also policy researchers, I think is important here too. So, um, and so the index of dissimilarity essentially captures what, I, what you see here on this slide. So uh, this would be, uh, this is what segregation looks like. It's, so it's really trying to measure um, this distribution of people. And so the idea um, is uh, that you will see lower dissimilarity in, indices and therefore less segregation or something if the black dots and the white houses were sprinkled about. But I think it's probably clear to understand that that is not really a metric of of a lot of the measures that I talked about in the paper um, and that I've just uh, spoke about earlier just a minute ago. Uh, but I do wanna say a little bit about the persistence of even that style of separation. And so here, what you see are numbers from 2010. I'm really eager to see uh, the numbers once they've been processed for 2020. But you see, what you see here is uh, a comparison between 1980 dissimilarity indices and 2010 dissimilarity indices. And uh, so the red line denotes uh, this uh, dissimilarity index of 60, which uh, most sociologists and economists would say is an indicator of high uh, segregation or separation. And uh, the green line is 30, which, uh, you know, is, is thought to be low uh, separation. And what I want to kind of point out here is that even though a lot of people, especially in the wake of the 2010 census, were carrying on about how segregation seemed to be over, what you see is that even though we don't quite have the same high separation or dissimilarity numbers that we saw in 19. 80, um, we do see very high, like basically no one's low and we still see a lot of very high dissimilarity uh, indices. And, um, and so I think it's, it's important to understand that, that uh, these are also the metropolitan areas in which uh, black people are most uh, prevalent. And I think it's also worth pointing out here, um, the Cleveland uh, uh, metropolitan area number. So uh, we see that in uh, 1980, uh, Cleveland uh, had a dissimilarity index of, of more than 80, almost 90, which is extremely high. Uh, that's, that's basically um, 
it's almost complete. <laughs> it's almost complete separation. Uh, we see that uh, in 2010, that number was uh, closer to 70, so quite a decline, but still very high uh, separation. And that probably feels familiar to a lot of uh, you who are in uh, the area right now. Uh, one other piece I just think is worth highlighting. So uh, in addition to this, these types of metrics of segregation, there is also increasing segregation and separation between it's like actual cities and suburbs. And that is where, you know, so, so the, a lot of the classic measures are really good at measuring uh, differences within cities and also in kind of immediately surrounding areas. But uh, there's also increasingly like um, a hardening of, of uh, various city suburb lines. So that I think is, is relevant for understanding the story I'm about to tell now that I'm going to switch the conversation and start talking about policing finally. Uh, so uh, in this portion of the talk, I'm gonna discuss mechanisms of pro-segregation policing. Now, uh, as an overarching point, and, and these are the six, not that I'm going to talk about, they're the six in the paper, I'm going to spend time talking about four of them. But uh, what you should note is that all of these dynamics I'm discussing here are routine aspects of policing. So, you know, it was really, um, you know, uh, powerful that the Dean pointed out at the beginning in the introductory portion, that these issues have gone on much longer than, uh, than in the um, wake of the death of George Floyd um, uh, in you know, his killing by Derek Chauvin, of course, the killing of Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery, all of the uh, lives that have been lost, not just because of direct police violence, of course, but also because of private racism and white and anti-blackness and white supremacy. Um, and those uh, lives are not just lost because of individual brutal cops, right? They're not just uh, lost because of individual problems. They're lost uh, because of these deeper processes of anti-blackness and white supremacy that are baked into, of course, not just policing, but, but policing. And so uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that the framework I'm operating on here is one in which we're focused on the routine violence of policing and not just the type of violence that tends to make headlines. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. So one of the dynamics I talk about extensively in my work will feel very familiar to people, to really anyone who has been uh, a black person moving about white space. Um, and so one basic function that police can play a role in is what I call patrolling borders. So what does that mean? I'm uh, relying here on the story of Richard, who is a 19 year old uh, a uh, black man who was living in Baltimore, who's part of a study that I led, a participatory research study with Baltimore youth in 2015. And Richard uh, was kind of just telling us a story about uh, his most recent encounter with the police. And the story you know, goes like this. So Richard and some of his friends uh, were, had, you know, it was the summertime and they were uh, visiting a friend in a neighboring city. And they just sort of, you know, like kids do who don't have uh, a bunch of activities to entertain them over the summer. They just kind of walked around. They spent the rest of the day walking around because they were outside of Baltimore, which was unusual. And they walk across, they come across a subdivision uh, where there are lots of big houses and it is a, a white subdivision according to Richard. And uh, they were stunned by what they saw. They, you know, Richard says, you know, they had pools and stuff. We didn't know pools was out there. We didn't know how nice it was. So he was just looking around, just looking, just roaming the streets, just looking at everything. Now, Richard is not a naive person. He knew that he and his friends are taking a risk by walking around this unfamiliar area. But 
Richard was really excited. Um, he talked about how he wanted to go into real estate and just being able to see all of this wealth was really amazing. So they just walk around. And as you might imagine, I, you know, I've already told you this is a story about a police encounter. So uh, they're walking around, they stop for a while, they, they're about to leave and get back on their, their merry way and a police officer shows up. Um, the police officer comes in a car, she gets out, she, uh, you know, asks Richard and his friends for identification. You know, Richard sees the police officer and he's uh, really afraid. Uh, and he, you know, tells his younger cousin who's with him, he's like, you know, don't worry. If they have to take someone, I'm going to tell them to take me, you're going to be fine. So these are the types of, of fears that he was forced, and he and his his friends and his cousin were forced to encounter. But the officer takes the IDs, she runs the IDs and nothing comes back. And she just sort of says, okay, well, you know, have a good day you know, after this uh, encounter. Uh, so this is to say, nothing happens. So Richard says, oh, I guess one of the neighborhood watchers called on us or something. Nothing actually happens. This was according to Richard. So according to the person who was telling us about this, uh, this is what some people will call a procedurally just encounter, right? So nothing, there's no um, obvious violence that takes place, but the message that is sent is very clear. The message that Richard takes away from this is that he doesn't belong in that neighborhood or neighborhoods like it. That he and his friends, if they go to neighborhoods like it, the neighborhood watchers are going to call. And that, I argue, is a very routine, almost functional, seemingly functional aspect of policing that reinforces racial residential segregation because it tells certain people where they belong and where they do not belong. Uh, in the article, I also talk about having my own experiences with this type of policing and the message the sent, I can say even from personal experience is very clear. So next I wanna say a bit about constructing jurisdiction, which is another one of the pro-segregation policing mechanisms. Uh, and I'm actually uh, right now in collaboration with another scholar writing more about this, but so I'm gonna say what I mean. So constructing jurisdiction, you know, uh, policing, as, as you as might feel almost like a truism, is organized into uh, districts and precincts. Uh, that's how policing operates. And, you know, uh, there are, uh, there is some research, so I'm drawing particularly here on the research of Donica Gordon. You see right here, I have the uh, Cleveland police map. So I, you know, I'll rely on you to tell me whether you think these lines reflect a lot of pre-existing racial segregation. I'd be, I'd be curious to know what you think. But uh, so the work of Donica Gordon tracks a redistricting process in a Midwestern city, a different one, uh, in which uh, uh, Professor Gordon finds uh, through her ethnographic work that the districts are basically, like the police department designs the districts to and purposely to map onto pre-existing racial segregation because they have sort of, you know, alleged community policing oriented ideas that different districts need different types of policing and different types of support. So there's this uh, bizarre way in which the entire enforcement regimes in the black residential area in the white residential area and in the uh, downtown business district are completely different from each other. And the, the, and you know, there's something critical about this because uh, you know, historically, it's not actually unclear how police districts are organized and how they're created. Uh, you know, there's a joke um, that some people call the bud shell method uh, for uh, designing police districts, which is to say, you know, a cop, um, like the cop leader who's, who's responsible for the districts, you know, drinks a bud and uh, gets a shell map pulls out the map and just starts drawing districts along whatever main thoroughfares that officer thinks might uh, be good. 
And uh, more recently, there has been an introduction of algorithms and technology to design police districts, which uh, sounds like it might be good at first, but the problem is the inputs are only about dividing up the numbers of cars and dividing up the numbers of officers and not so much about some of the concerns that we kind of have in policing about democracy, about voice, which is odd for a districting process. But you know, I'm happy to say a little bit more about that in Q&A. I don't talk about um, the kind of the solution world very much in this particular project, but in the, the project that's forthcoming that we're working on, we spend a lot of time examining uh, this, this idea of uh, democratizing the criminal legal system. And if you want to do that, how police districts could be a part of that conversation. Uh, I'll say a bit more about that shortly. So uh, next, uh, I want to highlight how police um, policing constructs neighborhood reputations. And I'm gonna give two examples of that. So um, I did some research uh, with a team in Dallas, Texas, in the, in the kind of the, the larger Dallas area. And one of the people I interviewed was Jennifer, it's a 24 year old Latina mother. And she was telling a story about how she and her husband decided to move to the Fort Worth area. And they were looking around various suburbs. And one of the places they came across was uh, Mansfield, Texas. They came across a house in Mansfield, Texas. She and her sister did uh, also. And Mansfield uh, has been known as ranked as one of the best places to live. I don't know what about it, but, but that's a pretty high designation. Uh, and Jennifer was excited about the house they saw and the community. But then when she and her husband and her sister started asking around about whether they should consider moving to Mansfield, Jennifer says, they said that Mansfield police were like, you know, pretty tough. So knowing that, and then she goes back and clarifies. And when I mean tough, I mean kind of like racist. So what she means there is that Latinx people in uh, the area, according to Jennifer and her, basically her confidant or her, her kind of people she was talking to, uh, they said that um, the Mansfield police have a tendency to profile people who look Latinx. And so uh, Jennifer did not move there. I went to interview her in another uh, area surrounding Fort Worth. And uh, so she was recounting their process, process and she explicitly said that the, the reputation of the police is the reason is kind of what gave her a sense of the broader community reputation and told her that she and her family did not belong there. There's another way in which policing constructs neighborhood reputations and that's through the use of crime data. So, he, so here's the thing, right? So like we have a number of fair housing laws that restrict uh, what realtors and landlords and basically real estate professionals more generally can tell potential tenants or home buyers about their uh, about the neighborhoods they're considering. So uh, a lot of this law st stems from the Fair Housing Act and particularly is prohibitions on what we call racial steering. So the idea is that real estate professionals, so private uh, people, private uh, entities are barred from uh, kind of suggesting that white people go to a white area, you know, Asian American people go to an Asian American area, etc. cetera. Uh, there are uh, broader emanations from that idea. So there's also racial code words that are all, that um, are also prohibited to some degree. So uh, for example, uh, uh, the idea that a place is high crime can be associated as a racial code word for having a lot of black people. And so there is some uh, suggestion, or at least there's a belief among real estate professionals that real estate professionals should avoid telling a potential home buyers or tenants about crime rates because they could be accused of engaging in racial residential steering. This is what the professional uh, uh, kind of literature speaks about as being uh, important to avoid. And so 
That being said, I should note that racial residential steering uh, doctrine hasn't you know, produced a fair housing market, right? Like it's not, it's not the most robust uh, set of, of like body of law. However, it does constrain uh, certain types of activity. So what do realtors do in the um, absence of being able to, uh, being feeling fully free to talk about crime rates with potential tenants or home buyers? They refer people to the police department or refer them to these types of proprietary, proprietary uh, sources like crimereports.com, various uh, websites that uh, score neighborhoods along multiple vectors, drawing from uh, police data. And so police data is, uh, is real. Like crime is, crime is real. <laughs> However, um, the way certain crimes are coded, the, the frequency which, with, with which they are found in certain places are just as much or, or, or certainly heavily a product of police policy choices and implementation, not just kind of natural aspects of, um, of certain neighborhoods. So, so there's a way in which these policing choices and policies are constructing uh, the crime data, which therefore uh, contributes to this style of residential steering. So finally, I want to say a word about distributing racialized economic value. This is the last piece of pro-segregation policing that I'm going to talk about. But frankly, it's also, it's, to me, it might be one of the most important contributions of, of this work. So uh, just to give you an example. So this is, a, is an example that is more local to you. Uh, this is um, uh, an excerpt from a, a, an interview our team uh, in kind of interviewing people in Cuyahoga County did with Anne and Ron, of course, pseudonyms, uh, a, an affluent white couple that lived in Lakewood, uh, Lakewood, Ohio. So uh, we asked Anne and Ron uh, a question, which was, uh, tell me what you like about your community. What do you like about living in Lakewood? And so Anne starts rattling off things like grocery stores, the bike paths, and then item number three on her list are the police. Anne says, the police are amazing. When we had issues with the neighbors or there was an accident that we saw outside or there was a line down outside, she was a power line. Immediate, our taxes go to great use. And Ron says, yes, he chimes in and says, yes, they're high, but we get what we pay for. So what should, should you be thinking about this? So first, there's this idea that policing is almost a commodity that one purchases with higher tax rates. And so it's justified. It tells this kind of justification of having better policing because of, of greater taxes. Uh, the other thing you should note is that issues with the neighbors, um, that in the context of this interview was not about anything violent or deeply concerning, um, an accident that we saw outside or power line down, down. These are not violent crimes. So, you know, a lot of the conversations that we're having about policing in the wake of summer 2020 have really been asking people to uh, interrogate, how, do the police make us more safe? How much police, how much policing is necessary? And while it certainly seems that some policing of some, some type is necessary, we don't need police for dealing with power lines or spats with neighbors um, or, or accident response. And so one of the really interesting things that been, that's been happening in the wake of summer 2020 is more efforts by city governments to recognize that and respond to that and provide some sort of alternative responses. So at the very least, like the, at, at the very least kind of minimal reform uh, should at least be not having police be general purpose responders to every type of um, slight danger or even frankly inconvenience that people have. And I think we now have a broader understanding that you know, almost all non, like very few 911 calls are about episodes of violence. So, so basically the, the justifying narrative of having more and more policing, which is about protection from, from violence 
is not actually what underlies a, a lot of actual police encounters and a lot of ways in which people call upon the state for assistance. I want to give one other example of this distributing racialized economic value, and it comes from the research I previously mentioned in Dallas. So uh, I was interviewing a, another um, affluent white person um, who's, whose pseudonym was Anna. It's kind of odd to have the Anna and the Anna, but just go with it. I didn't pick pseudonyms. Uh, so Anna was living in an affluent neighborhood within the city of Dallas, and she starts to tell me about how they have their own police officer that they can uh, call in their neighborhood, and they'll check out the alleyways and stuff like this. Um, as I was listening to Anna, and as I was doing more research, I, I learned about uh, an, a program in Dallas is called Extended Neighborhood Patrol, and sometimes it's called Extended Neighborhood Patrol, uh, sometimes it has other names, but um, the idea is that um, kind of homeowners associations in Dallas can pull their money uh, and pay for a certain number of extra hours from the Dallas Police Department. And it's not just the, the extra hours of, of, um, of patrol, it's also that you get a number of other services. So for example, uh, if you have this local officer, you can get a direct cell phone line to the same officer who patrols your neighborhood in the regular hours. So you have a cell phone number, you, uh, they, they perform other services, you know, if your homeowners association pays enough. So like, you know, if you're out of town, they can, might come by and pick up your mail so it never looks like there's no one home. They'll also do a safety audit of your home. All of these great services uh, and we have this idea that it's really poor neighborhoods and especially black neighborhoods that that community policing is a theory that's for. But I think what we see here is, you know, this idea that the police are absent from suburbs is uh, completely a, a misnomer. Um, it's, a, it's a misstatement, I should say. Actually, the main difference is that in affluent places, people uh, have control over the, the police in their neighborhood. They feel that they are calling out the police and they will be serving them as opposed to them being there to control them. And this is a major vector through which uh, residential segregation is uh, reinforced. So in my last few minutes, I wanna say a bit about the anti-segregation approaches that I discuss in the paper. And I'm actually just gonna um, put all of them up now so I can just pick out a few. So, so theoretically, I could talk about five. So I mentioned earlier fair housing laws. Uh, so now in, uh, in the age of the, the new Biden administration, it's more conceivable that a uh, HUD or you know the Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development will go back to enforcing uh, this rule from uh, the Fair Housing Act called the Affirmatively to Further Fair Housing uh, uh, provision. And one could bring in policing into the municipal calculations about what it means to affirmatively further fair housing. So it's not good enough for, uh, for police just to be outside of the conversation about what fair housing would look like in a particular area. So, so that's part of what I'm proposing in this discussion of fair housing law. And I, and I should say, uh, there, you could also think about fair housing as more of a broader ethos for local governance. Governance, so the there's it's more about an ethic than it is about necessarily enforcing. But but this this is another piece. So um, one uh, uh, provision that will be familiar to especially you know you Clevelanders um, is structural reform litigation or you know, 12601, formerly 14141 consent decree processes as uh, given that Cleveland is the only municipality that has been under consent decree twice. Uh, one thing that I think is missing from uh, from conversations and structural reform litigation is what to do about residential segregation, which really just reinforces a lot of the racist and unconstitutional and biased policing that uh, the structural reform litigation is meant to address. And it is possible to bring in ideas like segregation into uh, the consent decree process. We've seen it in, in cases of mental health um, where uh, 
part of the Portland consent decree was to uh, to have a focus on shoring up mental health services and mental health centers in Portland uh, because of an awareness of the interconnection between policing and mental health in uh, the case of Portland. We have similar sorts of interventions with respect to segregation, but no consent decrees uh, at the federal level have really addressed segregation as a piece of things. Uh, reckoning with tragic past, presents, and futures. This is something I'm really um, beating the drum about right now. And that I, I talk about it in this anti-segregation work, but um, I mentioned I've been doing some work in, uh, related to Oklahoma and, uh, and uh, investigating previous uh, uh, incidents through which policing and not just individual police officers, but police policies and departments have been part of perpetuating anti-blackness and white supremacy and there's a way in which there has to be perpetual reckoning so not just for you know not just single apologies um you know as we've seen in policing uh, in some cases not just apologies for specific incidents of failing um to uh to intervene in in racial brutality uh but but this is to say uh this is to say that the collective memory and the process of legal estrangement, which is um, which is a, a, an idea I've written about in other work, is historically rooted. So all of these ideas about do black people trust the police or not can't be solved without specific reference to and deep analysis of history. We've seen this in a lot of other areas. And I think it's really important to bring this into the daily work and daily consideration of policing. Uh, next, uh, I talk about reimagining the police districting process, and I was alluding to that a little earlier, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it now. But this is to say, uh, you could have great transparency. So I'm thinking about um, HR1, which is the piece of legislation that uh, Congress is currently considering on voting rights. And one of the really important parts of HR1 is this uh, is focus on partisan gerrymandering and how they're going to get rid of it. And uh, they uh, try to get rid of it by having things like, um, by basically enforcing nationally independent redistricting commissions. So taking redistricting out of the hands of the state legislature, um, making it more transparent. So actually um, you know, setting a set of criteria that the redistricting process has to go through and also um, uh, um, making uh, the people who draw the maps actually discuss how uh, their, their maps fit up with those criteria, also requiring transparency with the uh, data that districters, uh, district map drawers are using. All of these examples should be brought into policing if you're really serious about this idea of democratizing the criminal legal system. And uh, so but but the the police districting process right now is completely opaque. So so the forthcoming work will be focused on unpacking this police districting process. And finally, I just want to talk a little about a little bit about strategic non-response, which is probably my my pet solution uh, in all of this bunch. And it's also one that can raise people's hackles. Um, basically, the idea is that police should actually not respond to everything. And particularly if there's some evidence uh, from the call, from the nature of the call, there's nothing to be worried about. So uh, let me give you an example. I think a lot about uh, the death of Elijah McLean and the preceding 911 call when I talk about strategic non-response. So if you listen to that 911 call, there was nothing going on there. I mean, essentially the caller says, this kid looks weird and is walking down the street and waving his hands. Uh, the police respond to that call for some reason, and uh, Elijah McClain winds up dead. And we could tell that a, we could tell that story about you know there should be mental health responders, you know like this like why aren't there other types of community responders? But sometimes the state shouldn't respond to things, um, and uh, and we need to be really focused on trying to shore up informal, non-weaponized uh, types of responses. And you know, to say a little bit more about that, uh, 
we live in a society right now that is fear-based and is really uh, has a has a, a a low bar for what constitutes risky behavior. There are ways that the state can teach us to be a little bit better, I think. And also, um, there uh, there are examples of, of police departments doing this. So I give in the article an example of Piedmont, California, um, which is a, a community surrounded by Oakland. And essentially, uh, so there's a black couple. The, the Piedmont, California is all white and Asian, pretty much, uh, basically 100% white and Asian. A black couple moved uh, to the area, um, a, a couple that had been previously unhoused. And uh, the Piedmont Police Department received many police calls uh, on the black couple. Uh, people saying things like, oh, I think they're using drugs when uh, someone was just smoking a cigarette, these types of things. And the police chief of Piedmont basically says, we know who these people are and we're actually just not going to respond to that. Uh, and it just shows the power. And I guess I'll say one other thing about that, which is um, we have, we're fortunately having so much more conversation about uh, dispatch now and 911 and what it's used for. And uh, one of the things that's important to understand about 911 is that dispatchers place codes on things. They put priority, different priority levels on things all the time. There's already a triage process. So when I talk about strategic non-response, you might wanna rethink it as strategic, very slow response. But the key, the overarching idea here is that uh, police are already, and dispatchers are already assessing risk and right now we live in a world where we choose to focus on the risk of the state not showing up or the police not showing up. But we, I think we understand now from examples like Elijah McClain, um, from examples like George Floyd and you know, counterfeit $20 bill leading down this horrible path, that there is great risk in the police actually showing up uh, in certain instances. And so the, the, the final, proposal is to sort of rethink how we calculate those sorts of risks. I'm going to stop there and I thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Bell. So we're going to deploy uh, the question right now uh, for CLE purposes. Um, I think you'll see a question on your screen. Uh, go ahead and answer that. You just need to pick an answer and, uh, and, uh, and click it and we'll give you a few seconds to do that. In addition, um, submit your questions to the Q&A and I'll take a look at those and try to um, ask some questions for Professor Bell. Um, so type those in. We can't call on you to speak uh, live because we're in the webinar format. And of course, um, there are a lot of great things about the webinar format. We've got over 100 participants in this um, uh, webinar today, which is really exciting. But uh, you know, we, we can't, uh, Professor Bell can't hear the applause that I know you all are giving her. So we just thank her for that excellent uh, excellent lecture, and we'll move into the Q&A here um, in just a few more seconds. But go ahead and answer the poll for CLE purposes, and then um, go ahead and type any questions you have into the chat. I know that, uh, I, I believe it was um, uh, Magistrate Greg Clifford uh, had kind of raised his hand with a question, but unfortunately I can't call on you, uh, Magistrate Clifford, but you're welcome to type your um, question into the, uh, into the Q&A. Uh, and I'll try to pass those along. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, launch into one first uh, while you all are typing. So um, it occurred to me when you were talking and you did such an effective job of uh, talking about our actual community in Cleveland. Um, in addition to the police districts, we have a lot, as a lot of jurisdictions do, not every, um, but we have a, a lot of small municipalities, right, that, that are gathered in the Cleveland metropolitan area. Um, you know, in addition to Cleveland, we got East Cleveland and Bedford Heights and Shaker Heights and Cleveland on and on forever, all the heights. It, do, you, do you think that that has, um, um, would changing that, having one large municipality, um, does that improve, is that a mechanism that could improve some of these structural problems with policing and segregation? Or do you think that's kind of not necessarily relevant, not necessarily a solution? So that's a Question. Uh, I've thought about that quite a bit, actually, in the context of Cleveland. Um, so 
that would not resolve the issues, right? Because I, even in, in unified police departments, there can still be different styles of policing in different areas, but it actually would be helpful, I think, in a few different ways. So one is like, think about a place like East Cleveland. Um, there are just fewer resources, an under-resourced city, and therefore it's an under-resourced uh, police department in certain types of ways, which means you have things like pay differences, you have differences with hours. I mean, there are all kinds of, of, of distinctions with across these local police departments. I mean, I mentioned Lakewood as an example, right, where there are, it's kind of like a, a greater sort of resources. And, um, and then, of course, there are lots of other areas with more resources. So, so part of what this type of consolidation would do would be to, to deal with a resource issue. But I think more broadly, what it would do is allow for leadership that is, um, that can interrupt some of the, the themes that I was talking about. Um, and we, uh, you know, we, we see that police leadership is really, really important because policing is such a hierarchical profession. So it actually matters a lot um, what types of values a police chief uh, is espousing. And I think you'd have a better alignment between policy and practice in in if in a consolidated area where you have a lot of segregation and these kind of like particulars of the the local um, framework excellent thank you so um a question from the uh chat uh from one of our students um how do we change uh, people's minds to get them to understand progress in policing as being in their best interest? So she's talking about regular folks, non-law enforcement officers, non kind of really politically active, ordinary citizens. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's so, so I think it's really, really, so, so I, you know, I mentioned, I, I tell stories, right? Like I, um, interview people, I'll do qualitative research, and I do that in order to be able to humanize a lot of the dynamics that we're talking about here. And I think that that like lack of knowledge, um, the, the, the sense that people, the stakes are removed from people comes from the fact that there's not a lot of human stories uh, shared about, um, and, and critically, uh, you know, I think it's, it's notable, right, that in the wake of the death of George Floyd, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible that it took watching Derek Chauvin, you know, kill, brutalize him for eight minutes and 46 seconds to motivate people who hadn't been motivated before. But it is notable. I think what that says is it's possible that even people who feel very removed from these concerns um, can sometimes feel close to them. But what's critical, and this is what I try to highlight in the talk, is that not George Floyd level, but other types of brutalizations and kind of racialized experiences are part of uh, daily life of the daily lives of a lot of people who a lot of you know white people who you know who don't see themselves as implicated here care a lot about. And so I think that story sharing is critical. I think educating people more about systemic racism, making it part of our like daily parlance through curricula all of this stuff is is really really uh, important excellent thank you um so a a different question um uh what is the impact of prior history of gun violence in certain communities on policing response yeah, so, so that's a that's a somewhat of a complicated question because um, it varies from place to place. So I'm going to say a little bit, say a little bit more. Um, so, um, so there are so one of the narratives that one might hear from uh, from people who are really in favor of of greater police presence in certain communities, so like things like hotspots policing, et cetera. The justification for things like hotspots policing, other types of um, you know focused deterrence, all of this is uh, previous histories of gun violence. So the idea is that you know the, the police can interrupt that. Now it's interesting, but it, and, and I think I should say that there are data to support the idea that. Uh, interventions like hotspots and focused deterrence lead to less um, gun violence and therefore saves lives. I think that's really relevant and that's a, as a, as a, a important issue. 
But I will also say that it's, it's not totally clear. So that's the justification for things like focus deterrence. Um, however, uh, there are places with long histories of gun violence in which uh, you know, police have long been absent. So which is to say policing is about policy choices. They're, they're not like natural responses to like what the crime that is already occurring in communities. Um, and then there's also a way in which uh, many people in marginalized communities say that the fact they feel that they need to carry guns and engage in gun violence is in part because even though police are highly present, they may not protect them. So this is the classic like over presence. I'm not gonna say over protection, <laughs> but, but like but over policing um, and under protection problem in, in policing, which is that many people who are in marginalized communities feel that they have to protect themselves through mechanisms other than the police. So there are ways in which there's a self-reinforcing nature to all of this uh, heavy police presence. Great, thank you. Um, so um, let's see, other um, questions from the chat. Um, so here's an interesting one. We at the National Lawyers Guild have called for the abolition of the police. What is your opinion of this goal? Is that something worth striving for in the long run? Yeah, so I will say I'm, I'm in support of um, mechanisms that, that are pushing toward abolition. And I've signed on to document supporting abolition, but I will say I, I need to, I feel I need to be specific about what abolition is. Um, so I think the, the kind of broader ethic that the world we wanna live in is one in which we don't have a racialized police system uh, in which we understand that the basic functions of, you know, a lot of what I was talking about in the talk or basic functions of police, which are functions that reinforce racial hierarchy. So I think that type of analysis means that it's almost inevitable that I, if I'm really serious about my work that I would have to take abolition seriously. But I do think there are a number of threats. And one of the main ones that really that I'm struggling with right now is that, you know, I mentioned I'm a qualitative researcher. I do, I, um, I, when I think about who my work is accountable to, I think about accountability to communities that I'm from and that I have uh, studied. <laughs> and um, if I went out and took an opinion poll right now about whether abolition is good or not, that the abolition wouldn't win. Now, does that mean I'm not pushing for it? No, but it does mean that there is a potential leg like movement legitimacy problem, uh, which is to say right now, the movement that I support is not really, it's not actually representing the views of people in marginalized communities, but it is reflecting maybe the concerns. So this, and, and of course, like organizing changes things. Like I get all of that, but this is like, I think, you know, as you may recall, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of time, so I don't spend too long on this question, but one more thing I wanna say is that uh, you recall that over the summer uh, in the midst of calls to defund there then became all these like weird Vox and New York Times stories about you know going to black communities and asking people what they thought about defund. And then it was like, but wait, this. <laughs> like, no, we don't like that. And then it just delegitimates the project. Whereas that's not the warrant for defund or abolition. It's it's a it's a visioning and it's a it is part of a movement. It's not necessarily what what everyone already thinks. So anyway. Um, those are some thoughts, but I think is, but I appreciate the question and the opportunity to talk a little bit more about my views on abolition. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. So um, uh, here's a question. Do you have examples of cities that have successfully reformed or made progress on some of the major issues you've, identif you've identified? And were those changes driven by residents, by elected leaders? Where did the driver for that come from? Yeah, this is always a question that people ask and it's a question that I struggle to answer because there is pretty much, um, there's nowhere that has really undone all the dynamics I'm talking about. So like some, one of the easy answers that people used to like to give is Camden, but I think that's a problematic answer. Um, so, uh, you know, I will say um, there are places that have made 
more efforts to have more community control over policing. Um, so I think one here's an example. Maybe not a city that's getting it right, but an intervention I think is good. So the um, Chicago's um, uh, new civilian, uh, the new civilian uh, uh, kind of governance board has a thing right that I think is important, which is to say it's not just civilian review of for the purposes of police discipline, which is like inevitably going to be like weak. Uh, it's civilian engagement in police in designing policies as more forward looking that that kind of early engagement, I think, is a better model for for reimagining how we would have public safety governance, which is to say it shouldn't be off in a corner done by some people who imagine themselves experts and people with like the right gut instincts, but instead uh, should be really meaningfully controlled by people who are not the police. I don't think, I'm not proposing Chicago as a model, but I am saying that that is a feature of the new, a new governance structure that, that I find to be uh, desirable for some of the uh, reasons I talked about. Excellent, thank you. So um, <clears throat> I do think we are uh, about out of time. Um, there are some other great questions in the chat. I'm sorry that we can't uh, get to all of them. <clears throat> um, I just want to you know, take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Bell very much for joining us, giving us such a great um, insightful lecture. I'll also give a quick um, shout out. I was, uh, you know, intrigued at her, you know, she highlighted the role that HUD uh, might be able to play in, you know, talking about housing and residential segregation and how that plays into this. Um, of course, if you've got innovative ideas for that, you should call up your um, Representative Marsha Fudge, who is just confirmed today as the new HUD secretary, a proud alumna of the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. So um, very, very uh, on topic. So uh, thank you all. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. Um, stay tuned for other great upcoming events. And thank you to Professor Bell. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great evening. <laughs>